For several months, we have been talking about a universal problem of mankind. Uh, all civilizations have ways of expressing it. But uh, our Western civilization has found the classic expression of it in uh, a verse here in this book. And uh, it's that expression that some of you will recognize immediately. I read it in Romans 7 and 19. And it's page 982. Romans 7 and 19. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. And that's the universal problem. Moral impotence. The contemporary psychologists and philosophers call it the sheer perversity of the human will. And it's really this problem that has given the lie to the naive belief that men and women could be educated into good behavior. Because especially here in the States, we've discovered that men and women can know what is right and can be filled with good intentions to do what is right, but they still are unable to do it. Because of some invisible supernatural power that they don't seem capable of controlling inside themselves. And so you can be very clear about what you ought to do, and you can know very well why you should do it, and yet you find that this power seems to work against your own will, it appears. It appears it's even working against your own will to make you do what you don't want to do. Now, no one has given this, this any authoritative kind of name except the people who have written in this book. And they have named it. And uh, you can give the name, uh, you can find the name there in the verse following that, verse 19. It's uh, verse 20. People have often given the name to the results it brings about in their lives. Envy, jealousy, anger, irritability. But the power itself they have never given a name to. But uh, here Paul does it in verse 20. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin, and the Greek word is actually he hamartia, and those of you who know Greek knows that he is the, it's the definite article. And Paul says, but it is the sin which dwells within me. And it's been a tremendous step forward for many of us in our struggle with our defeated Christian lives when we at last agreed that it was not I myself that was getting irritable or envious or that was losing my temper. But it was a power inside me that seemed to wor work alongside my own will. And it was a tremendous step forward for many of us when we realized that there was a power inside us called the sin. Really, until we found that out, brothers and sisters, many of us just used to beat ourselves to death. We used to condemn ourselves every time we lost our temper, every time we got angry. We just attacked ourselves and beat ourselves and came into bondage about guilt and about failure and moral impotence. And it was a great step forward for many of us when we at last set ourselves apart from this power inside us that was doing this kind of thing and we began to regard it as apart from ourselves and as an enemy. And we cease to identify it with ourselves. And that's a great step when you take that step. And many of us have found some degree of deliverance by doing that. Now, really, the opposite of doing that is to keep on thinking that it's me. It's me. I'm doing it. It's me that's failing. It's me that's failing. And all you do is fall into a vicious circle of self-effort, and then guilt of victory and defeat, of falling down and trying again, of hopelessly getting deeper and deeper into the whole defeat syndrome. 
And really, that kind of attitude, which is so full of self-deliverance, and trying to save yourself, that whole attitude of self-deliverance, and failure, and defeat, and guilt complex, is all that makes up the attitude of people who live under the law. Now, that's what Paul means in the verse, really, that we're uh, studying this morning when he uses that phrase, Romans 6 and 14 it is. Romans 6 and 14. That whole syndrome of self-deliverance and self-help and of New Year resolutions and self-effort and trying and trying and trying and striving and exercising your willpower as best you can, Romans 6 and 14 For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Now, that's what that phrase, under law, describes. That kind of self-effort kind of approach to this universal problem of mankind. Under law are the Greek words, hupa nomon. And it means that you're right under it. And when people are under the law, it means not just people who are supposed to fulfill the law. It means people who think they can fulfill the law by their own strength and by their own power. That's it, dear ones. And we need to be careful of that, you know. Because I think a lot of people say, you're under law when you're supposed to obey law. Well, you're supposed to obey law. There's no question about that. God makes that plain. He says, uh, Jesus himself says, I came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. God never argues in the Bible about whether you're to fulfill the law or not. What he does argue about is, that if you're trying to fulfill it by your own power and your own strength, and by simply trying hard and exercising more willpower, you're trying to destroy something inside you that only he can destroy. And he says that people who are in that state are people who are under law. They're right under the law. They can't obey it on their own, but they're trying to obey it on their own. And any of us in whom there dwells a resistance to God's way of deliverance, We are under law. See that? So, even a Christian who is trying hard to obey the law can still be under law. He or she can be under law if they think they have to get hold of this power of sin on their own and somehow beat it to death. And that's what most of us try to do. We know this thing is inside us, but we decide by more resolutions, by better prayer schedules, by better church attendance, by trying harder, by reading Dale Carnegie, by taking cold chars, by exercising more willpower, we'll somehow suffocate and strangle this power of sin. Now, you're under law when that's your kind of attitude. Because that's just destined to be an attitude of trying and falling and trying and falling and trying and falling until eventually you become indifferent to the whole business of sin and guilt. And then you lose completely any sense of God's presence. Now, loved ones, that's what a person under the law is. I think it's important to see that. Because I think a lot of us in these days think, oh, yeah, you're under law if you have to obey it. I'm glad we don't have to obey the law. Well, loved ones, there's nobody in that position. We all have to obey the law, not only the civil law, but the law of God. But a person who is under the law is a person who is trying to do that on their own and is trying to ignore this power of evil within them. That's what most of us do. Most of us accept Satan's deception just like fish taking the bait. And we accept it and we say, you're right, Satan. It's us that's wrong. It's us that have to get ourselves out of this by exercising willpower and self-effort and New Year resolutions. It's us that have to overcome this. And Satan is so happy. Because he knows he's giving us a job that is impossible. Why? Because the ones... Paul always makes a distinction between he hamartia and hamartia. Now, doesn't that enlighten you? (laughs) The The first one is the sin. And Paul makes a distinction all the time between the sin and sin. And at times, you see, for instance, in our present verse, Romans 6 and 14, he just talks about sin. But what we're talking about at the moment is the sin. It's the power of sin. What is the power of sin? It's really, well, someone has described it this way. This power is an influence or evil will that emanates from the rebel spirit of evil whom Jesus called Satan, who established a whole way of life and set of values 
based on the belief that there is no creator who can be trusted like a loving father. Now this power is an influence or it's an evil will that comes from the rebel spirit in the universe whom Jesus designates Satan. In other words, when you talk about the sin, you're talking about an actual power of rebellion and independence of God that can be felt and sensed and can be passed on to other people. Loved ones, you get some kind of idea of that power in the type of ritualistic slayings that Manson took part in. That kind of thing. There you begin to feel the very power of evil right there. Or in a group of kids who are just uh, taken by a mad animal-like frenzy and utterly lose control in some graduation party. And they just begin to do anything at all. Or in a bunch of drug addicts who are completely shot on heroin. And there's just a presence of the power of sin among them. Now, loved ones, that's what the sin means. It means the very power of Satan that makes you rebel against God. It's that power that produces that vehemence in your temper that even you don't understand. Isn't that true? That at times you've lost your temper and you've been surprised yourself. You've kind of wondered, oh, well, I, I know I, I can't keep my temper too well, but that isn't me, surely. Or it's that power that produces the incredible bitterness in resentment towards another person that you feel. You know those situations where there's a cause for resentment of some kind, but the resentment that you find taking hold of you is not in comparison at all to the apparent external cause. It's utterly out of proportion to it. It's just taking hold of your own li whole life. It fills your mind. Uh, brothers, I think it's the same thing that uh, takes hold of us in lust when we can't get away from the thing. It seems to fill our minds. The thoughts are everywhere. It's the power of sin that does that. Now, loved ones, that's why God makes a distinction, you see, in his word between that kind of power that can take hold of a whole administration and turn it into a lying, deceptive group of, of liars. It's that kind of power that can take hold of hypocritical church people and make them say one thing and do another. It's an incredible, invisible, spiritual power that is invincible as far as our own human efforts are concerned. Now, brothers and sisters, I remember in my own life, it was a tremendous step when I saw not only that the defeat in my own Christian life was due to a power beside myself, but it was a tremendous step in my own Christian life when I saw that I couldn't deal with that power. And honestly, I'm afraid that many of us are under the deception that we can deal with that power. And while I was under that deception, it was like struggling in quicksand. You know, you'd struggle, and the more you'd struggle, the deeper you'd go down. And of course, that's God's good plan. It's God's good plan that that would happen. Now, why? Why does that power have any control of you and me? Why does it? After all, most of us would say here, we don't want to rebel against God. We don't want to get independent. We don't want to be bad-tempered. We don't want to be jealous. We don't want to be filled with lust. Now, why has that power any control of you? After all, it is a spiritual principle that no spiritual power in the universe can take control of any human's will unless that human being is willing for it. That's a spiritual principle. No spiritual power, whether God or Satan, can take control of anybody's will or mind or emotions unless that human being is willing for them to do it. So why is this power able to control us? Now, I remember asking the Holy Spirit, you know, to lead me into truth about that. Jesus, you remember, said the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. And I remember asking the Holy Spirit, will you show me why this is so? Why does this power take hold of me at times when I don't want it to? And bit by bit, the Holy Spirit began to show me something inside that was more grotesque and more monstrous than anything I ever thought belonged to me. Dear ones, it was an attitude that I had never really seen before until he showed me it. And it's referred to in different ways in the Bible. If, if you like to look at Romans 7 and 24 and 25, you'd 
see one phrase that is used to designate it there. Romans 7, 24, 25 points out, of course, that the defeated Christian life is not God's will at all. And it's not where Paul was left, you remember. A lot of us read Romans 7 as if Paul's final word is, uh, so then uh, I do not do what I want, but the evil I uh, want to avoid is what I do. Well, that isn't the final answer at all. 24 and 25 is the final answer. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Then he answers, thanks be to God that there is a deliverance through Jesus Christ our Lord. Then here is the phrase, dear ones, that describes this spy within us that unites with the power of sin. So then, I of myself. Now that's it. I of myself. And the Holy Spirit revealed to me a whole I of myself attitude that I've never seen before. A whole attitude of independence and rebellion against God that I had covered up with a whole lot of pseudo-Christianity for years. And the Holy Spirit began to show me there is some attitude within you that has an aversion to God. And I would say, oh, no, no, I love God, I want to pray to him, I want to serve him. And the Holy Spirit kept getting me down to it. There is a something inside you that has an aversion to God. And it's that something that allies with this power of sin from Satan. It's that attitude that is a spy within you and that opens the door and lets the power of sin into your life. And, you know, I kept refusing to believe it because I was a pastor and I spent all my days trying to serve God. And uh, I enjoyed going to him in prayer very often. At other times, I didn't enjoy it. But there were times when I really did enjoy going to God in prayer. And I kept arguing with the Holy Spirit, no, no, that isn't really me. And he kept showing me more and more of that old I of myself attitude. That old attitude that wanted to be God, that wanted its own way, that persisted in insisting on its own rights, that was very game, you know, to be religious and to appear very prayerful, but wanted its own way as far as God was concerned. Now, that attitude is referred to, you know, in different ways. Galatians 5 and 17 is one of the other words that is used to talk about it, Galatians 5 and 17, that's page 1015, the ones in that uh, black RSV, page 1015, Galatians 5 and 17, for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and that's another word used, the flesh, it's that attitude within us that wants to be independent of God, though a great deal of us wants to depend on God, this attitude wants to be God itself. And you know that we've used the word in the past months, the old self. It's the old self that wants to run its own life and have its own way. And it's the old self, therefore, that produces bad temper. Because bad temper always comes out when you feel things aren't going the way you planned them to go, things aren't going the way you wanted them to go. And they're getting out of your control, so you lose your temper in order to bring them back into your control. It's the old self that produces the cold war between husband and wife. He won't do what you tell him, so okay, you have strong emotions, you'll call him back to heel just by running a cold war. He'll get tired before you do. And it's the old self that takes that attitude. The old self that takes that attitude with our roommates, dear ones. We decide we'll bring them back to heel like a dog because we'll run them into the ground emotionally. It's the old self that wants its own way and that wants to do that kind of thing. And the Bible calls it flesh, it calls it the old self, And it describes the attitude that that old self has very clearly to one's Romans 8 and 7. And uh, it certainly leaves no room for us saying that there's a little good inside us. 982 is the page, 982, and Romans 8 and 7. And talks about the attitude that this old self has. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. It would really help us a great deal if we really recognized that that's what does happen right enough. If that old self is still alive inside us, God can tell us to tithe and we'll tithe without tithing. That's right. The old self is subtle. 
It'll appear to be obeying God's commandment, yet it'll get its own way by some corny little compromise. The old self will get its own way because it is hostile to God. It has no interest in obeying God and it's subtle and shrewd and it'll give you lots of signs that you're a very religious and very Christian person as long as it can still get its own way. Because it is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And loved ones, it never does. We bluff ourselves, you know. We think, oh, no, no, brother, sometimes it does. No, it never does. It makes you think it does. But it continues to get its own way deep, deep down in your life. And that's where the dispeace is. And that's that old self. Now, the big step that I took in my life was when I discovered that God had done something with it. Because I tried for a while to strangle that as I tried to strangle the power of sin. I tried to tame the old self. I thought all it needed was discipline. You ought to discipline it. Just get it used to obeying God. But I wasn't up to its subtlety and its cleverness. Because it had really the subtlety of Satan himself. And it kept getting away from me and dodging. And I couldn't track it down with all the introspection that I practiced. And it was all oh, just a great step, you know, when I saw the truth that we have shared. That God has actually already dealt with that old self. And that that old self was crucified with Christ. And that God, in fact, took that old attitude of self-centeredness and self-deification and he placed me and Jesus on the cross 1900 years ago and he destroyed that old self there and then. And that was a great relief, you know, when I saw that that had actually happened. And you remember it's there in Romans 6 and verse 6. Romans 6 and verse 6, it's page 981. And it's good to look at that verse because it shows you what effect that had on the power of sin. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the sinful body might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin and it's hehamartia, to the sin. In other words, you see, the old self is the middleman. It's the old self that links up the power of sin and rebellion against God and independence of God, that power that we cannot control, that, uh, that is under the control of Satan. It's the old self that links that power up with our bodies. And what God did was to knock out the middleman. He knocked out this middleman, the old self, that kept opening the door and letting that power of sin in. And it was just such a relief when I realized that God had destroyed that power. And really, that's what we mean, dear ones, in Romans 6 and 14, you see, when we come to that last phrase there of verse 14 of Romans 6. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. That's what it means to be under grace. To realize that God, of his own good free generosity, has destroyed all the evil that is giving you all the trouble in your life. He has destroyed the old self that wants its own way. He alone has destroyed it. And you see, our responsibility is to stop trying to suffocate it ourselves. Our responsibility is to believe it to death. To believe it to death. God has already destroyed it. Our job is to believe God. And then it will become actual and real in our own lives. And I remember when I first saw that this believing involved two things. It involved considering and it involved submitting. And do you remember over the past weeks we have talked about those two things. Romans 6 and 11, you remember, talks about the considering. This is the way to make this real. Now, we are mad people, you know. We... We will hear that God destroyed the power and yet we'll still, the old self will still want to destroy itself. And that's the subtlety, you see. We find something inside us that really wants to go after this old self. And we say, ah, that's my will. My will is getting better, so my will really wants to destroy my selfish will. Well, it, it's a, it, you're lost. The selfish will never wants to destroy the selfish will. But it makes some threshing and some kicking and some effort and we are bluffed by it. And 
we hear of this message, you know, that the old self has been destroyed with Jesus, but then we find the old will trying to act against the selfish will. And we accept the bait and the deception again. And we say, oh, well, that's maybe true what Pastor said, but no, my will seems to be getting hold of the thing. Loved ones, your selfish will is not able to destroy your selfish will because it does not really want to destroy your selfish will. The only one who can destroy it is God. And he has done that in Jesus. And the only way we can have that made real in us is not by self-effort, but by believing. And believing means considering and submitting. Now look at the considering in Romans 6 and 11, you remember. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And you remember the Greek word legidso means not only to think intellectually that you're dead to sin, not only this kind of stuff, all the suggestion, I'm dead to sin, I'm dead to sin, I'm dead to sin. Not just that. Not just pretending with auto-suggestion, but it means treating yourself as really dead with Christ. It means treating yourself as really crucified with him. And as having no rights to your own way, and no rights to other people's respect, and no rights to other people's praise. Logizo, considering, means treating yourself as really crucified and really dead. Now you can see, loved ones, that that involves a willingness. It doesn't involve the exercise of your own will, which you're unable to do, but involves a willingness to be crucified. It involves a yieldedness, a willingness for God to get rid of that selfish will. In other words, legidso is not just think that it's so and it'll be so, it's treat yourself as really willing to be crucified. So you see, there's no point in saying, oh yeah, Lord, I consider that I'm crucified with you and uh, someone comes to you, insults you as they insulted Jesus, and you whip right back with sarcasm. That's not a willingness to be crucified with Christ. That's a mental assent to the truth that you were crucified with Christ, but an absolute unwillingness to be treated by others as if you're crucified with Christ. Or someone takes your coat, and you get mad because you spent so much money on that coat. That is a mental assent to be crucified with Christ, but an absolute unwillingness to be treated as if you're dead. No, I'm very much alive. I want my own coat. I'm alive and I need it. So, considering really involves willingness to be crucified. And you remember we did say that that willingness needs to be expressed at a given point in time. You remember that comes out in uh, Galatians 6 and 13a that we read a couple of weeks ago. 6 and 13a. You remember it, it, it runs the uh, 16b. I'm sorry. It runs. Do not yield yourself, your members to sin as instruments of wickedness. And you remember the Greek word is uh, paristano, and it means stop yielding your members to sin as uh, to sin as instruments of wickedness. And then, but yield yourselves to God as men who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments of righteousness. Yield yourselves. And there the word is parastasata, and it's the aorist. And it means yield yourselves at a given point in time. Dedicate in a moment of time yourself to crucifixion with Christ. You remember we emphasized that considering that you're crucified with Christ is not just a matter of continually trying to brainwash yourself. I'm dead with Christ. I'm dead with Christ. It's really a matter of asking the Holy Spirit to show you where am I not willing to be dead with Christ so that I can come to a point in time where I reach the ground of my heart and I'm willing to really be crucified. And it's very important, brothers and sisters, that the Holy Spirit sets that seal upon you at some time in your life, that you are really at the ground of your heart, and you are really willing to be crucified with Christ. You're willing not to have your own way anymore in your life. You're willing not to insist on your own rights anymore. You're willing not to assert yourself or defend yourself anymore, whatever it may cost you, even if it costs you death itself. It's very important to come to the point that the Bible talks about there, a definite time when you yield yourself to this crucifixion with Christ. A time of full consecration. Because it's from that instantaneous moment of readiness to die with Jesus that will come the power and the grace to walk in the submission. And the second part that you do, you consider yourself crucified with Christ, you submit. And submission has two sides. A negative side, and you get the negative side there in Romans 6 and 13a. Do not yield your members to sin as instrument of, of wickedness. 
Stop yielding your members to sin as instruments of wickedness. Stop providing for sin. Stop expecting to get irritable because you've only had five hours sleep the night before. Stop expecting to lose your temper when a certain situation crops up that always makes you lose it. Stop expecting other people to make special allowances for you that day because you were late in bed the night before. Stop providing for sin. That's the negative side of submitting. And the positive side is Romans 6 and 13b, you see. Yield yourselves to God as men who have been brought from death to life and your members to God. Yield your members to God as instruments of righteousness. Begin to bank on the life of God coming through you. To submit to the life of God. Begin to bank on God filling your mouth with words when you go forward to witness to somebody. Begin to bank on God filling you with love and with consideration for the person that you've had resentment towards. Begin to bank on God coming through with the power of his Holy Spirit. And really, that's the way the reality of Christ's crucifixion is made real in you. By believing and submitting. By considering yourself crucified with Christ. And coming to a real time when you're willing for that to take place. And then submitting yourself utterly to the Holy Spirit day by day. Now, loved ones, the miraculous result in my life, uh, and I came into it maybe eight years ago, the miraculous life, uh, result in my life was Romans 6 and 11. And it's good just to see it. Romans 6 and uh, 14, I'm sorry. Romans 6 and 14. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. And sin there is not he hamartia. It is not the sin, the power of sin. But it is sin, it is inward sin of any kind. Jealousy, envy, self-pity, anger, pride, all those things that destroy our lives. God's promise is real that that kind of thing will no longer have dominion over you in your own life. And that's really it, loved ones. It's a real freedom from sin in your own daily life. And that's what God's will is for us. That's why old Augustine, I won't give you the Latin, but old Augustine uh, uh, said, grace uh, does not only dismiss or remit sins, but, uh, but, uh, uh, but it makes it so that we ourselves do not sin. So Augustine said that. Grace not only remits our sins, but it makes it so that we do not sin. And old Luther put it this way, the Holy Spirit sanctifies people not only by the forgiveness of sin, but also by the laying aside, expelling and destroying of sin. And all loved ones, so many of us who have been Lutherans for years, you know, have, have maligned Luther. We've said, oh no, Luther taught us that we couldn't avoid sinning every day in our lives. Loved ones, this is old Martin speaking. The Holy Spirit sanctifies people not only by the forgiveness of sin, but also by the laying aside, expelling and destroying of sin. Loved ones, that's why a certain man in England, 300 years after Luther, said, he breaks the power of cancelled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. And loved ones, that's it. You know. And that's what the world wants to see. A body of men and women who do not just say, our sins are forgiven, our sins are forgiven, but a body of men and women who live in victory over sin. And that's why the Bible says, you know, that sin will no longer have dominion over you, because you are not under law, but under grace. And you know what we've been. We've been a bundle of little objectors. We've said, that's right. We're not under law, so we don't need to obey the law, so it doesn't matter whether I lose my temper or not. I'm under grace. God will forgive me. It doesn't matter what kind of miserable life I continue to live throughout the rest of my days. Oh, loved ones, it's a travesty, you know. God's word is just sure and firm. Sin will have no longer dominion over you because you are now under, not under law, but you're under grace. You're not trying to obey the law on your own, but you've allowed that old self to be destroyed. And it's now the power of the Holy Spirit obeying the law through you. I really thank God that that's his will for us, you know. And don't get shook, you know, if you're not in that spot yet, don't get shook. But see that that's where God wants your loved ones. And don't fight it, you know. Don't fight it with clever exegesis. You have to wipe out too many parts of the Bible to do that. 
It really just believe God's word and say to him, Lord, I want the power of cancel sin broken in my life. And I want to live like Jesus. And really he'll enable me to. Let us pray. Dear Father, Watergate has brought before us the need not only to speak high and holy words, not only to express intentions towards law and order, but to live it. And Father, our whole nation is in a crisis because we have not lived what we were preaching. And Father, we see brothers and sisters rightly turning away from you and from your word because so many of us have been preaching what we did not practice. So, Holy Spirit, we trust you to deal with it now and show us that it is not the way of self-help that brings victory over sin. It is the way of deliverance through experiencing the cross and the crucifixion of Christ in our own lives. We would trust you to make that real in each of us here this morning and make it real in these coming weeks and months so that there will begin to be a light upon the way and there will begin to be a group of people who practice what they preach and who not only talk about Jesus but live like Jesus. Father, we trust you for that, for your glory and for your working in our homes and our families and in our dormitories and our schools and our offices, that people may begin to see you living in front of them and not just hear us talking about you. We trust you for this, our Father, for your sake. Amen.